record any positions. All they do is they make this, you know, close the gripper, and then they pull it back up in the air, and then they rotate the base a little bit, and then they put it back on the table. And that's that's their first exposure into moving this around because that's as real life as it gets. I'm going to stand in front of a robot if I'm going to paint a fender, and I'm going to record a whole bunch of positions along there just manually doing it. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with um, whether you're teaching them to do relative positions and absolute positions, that's you just want to kind of get them some exposure to how it all works, especially if they're going to get into the Lynx motion robots. You want to build more theory than you do anything else. But after that, um, you know, I am a, not a huge fan of the relative activity. They've made that relative activity a heck of a lot harder than it needed to be, the relative to next and all of those things. It becomes very cumbersome for the kids, and they, they don't necessarily get what I really want them to know by the end, by the time that they're done. Really what I want them to know with things like relative, now if I take a look, um, this is how I teach my kids to use relative. If I'm going to, oops, I asked that to open. If I'm going to get that position, I'm going to call that, I don't care, I'm going to call that position 10. I use relative as the positions that are above it. So I can now say 11 is relative to 10 up in the air 100. And then if I ask it to go there, I now have that position. The part that I want the kids to really understand is if 11 now ever moves, so does 10. You know, I, I compare this back and forth to the CNC software that I'm now not going to write a relative program. I'm not going to write an absolute program. I'm actually going to hop back and forth all the time. Now all my up in the airs will go wherever the ones on the table go. So if I move this around, I say this is my position 21. I can say that 20 is relative to 21 down 100. And now I can put it back onto the table exactly where I want. If I ever move 20, 21 will move too. Or if I ever move 21, 20 will move. That's the only way that you really want them to start getting the grasp of things like relative. So be careful about a couple of the activities. If the kids really start to get overwhelmed by them, that's the concept that you really want them to take away from relative. And some of them will get a little bit caught up in the idea of that dipping process and putting it. Yeah, I, I want that. But the way the activity is written becomes a little bit disconnected from what the purpose was. Hey, Jim, do you have uh, the LMS open right there on your screen by any chance already? Which one? The the real one. I just kind of want to show everybody and give like a, a general overview um, in terms of what is it kids are supposed to learn out of this. And if you take a look, all the activities are right there in activity 3.1, and it's 3-1-A through 3-1-H. Those activities are the ones that the kids are going to do. And you start out, look at 3-1-2-A. You click on that, you end up with all the information you need for a kid to learn how to do a pick and place. And the activities show you step by step how to do it. And make sure that kids don't get locked into it because the step by step is great for this one part of the activity. But once they do this activity, like Jim said, um, once you get past about number four or five, activity, the, the fourth or fifth activity, they take everything they've learned and they start picking what's best. And that's, I think that's what, what Jim's saying. Sometimes you use relative, sometimes you use absolute. Um, but the activities are all just there to show. It. So you're going to start with a pick and place. The B, you're going to teach positions. So instead of moving to positions, you're actually going to teach it using X, Y, Z coordinates. And the relative positions is really a pretty difficult concept. Um, when kids get it, they really get it, but a lot of kids just don't get it. And the way Jim explained it, it's perfect. That's when you would use it um, interchangeably with some other stuff. So understand that all these activities are there. Um, some of the, the information sheets and the extra things that you see, if you take a look at the bottom left corner, you'll see links to some of the activities or some of the things that go along with it, like the background information sheet, the work envelope paper, and the, the robo-cell planning document. Um, that's all useful with this particular um, 
activity. It shows you screenshots of what it looks, what it should look like when the kids are done. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. Once you get to uh, after the relative one, um, I kind of let the kids uh, go off the range a little bit. Um, I, I don't really want to use relative for this, Mr. Can I do it this way? Yeah, do it any way you want as long as you get the job done. Because after the relative coordinates one, uh, you, you start doing some stuff that shows um, how to do pick and places with uh, different pieces of equipment. And it's not really so much exactly how you do it. It's just that you know the, the tools at the beginning. So A, B, C, um, D, E uh, all teach you the basics, going circular, going around an object. Then by the time you get to F, G, H, uh, those are some advanced ones. And the concepts that those teach really don't have anything to do with whether you do it using relative positions, whether you teach. Um, kids will pick their own things, their own ways to do it, and end up doing it any way they want as long as you teach those concepts. So though, that's where you get the activities. Um, and you do them right in order, A through H. Uh, some kids go faster than others. I have some other activities that I let the kids do when they, they get ahead. Um, I also am lucky enough to have two of the robots in my classroom. So each one of these activities, I have two groups of students working on an actual robot to do it. So it's it's actually kind of fun. Um, so those of you who have absolutely no experience with this, start right at 312A, the pick and place, and go through it step by step. The, the, if you do it first, it makes it so much easier to help explain to the kids. And the, the kids will actually be able to, uh, they see this like a computer game, and they actually just do exactly what, uh, the activities say to do, and for the most part, they're pretty straight up and they work very, very well. So I, I just really wanted to show everybody where all the stuff was. And I can tell you, like this one, the part that my kids get hung up on is if you're just doing the relatives up and downs, it, it won't do it. Um, each one of these containers actually has a floor. Because they have a floor, if you raise this up 200, go over and take it back down 200, it will crash into the floor. So that's really where a lot of this problem comes in. And if that causes your kids a problem, then in cell setup, uh, if I go to cell setup, you have a piece, you have a lot of different equipment that can be put into there. So if I say I want an ER for you, Robot, no slide base. I'll throw in a table just so I've got something to set this on. Uh, if you really want to raise the part up off of the table, you have the opportunity to do that if you use something like a buffer. Um, so if I use a storage device and I use one of the buffers, you know, I can sit that down there, I can put the part up on there, and then I don't necessarily have to worry about some of those things. So feel free to, to edit up the activities. If you've gone through it on your own and you ran into problems and you think that that's a problem all of my kids are going to run into and here's a way to solve it, then open the Word document and edit it. You know, change it to meet your needs. If something makes more sense to you and it, it feels like um, this should be this way, then, then do that. You know, the activities and things that are in the curriculum are really there for a brand new first year teacher, but other than that, it's just resources, and you kind of you need to change them up so that they meet your needs. So, Chris, where do we want to try to go? We've still got about thirty minutes. What do we want to try to do? Well, I guess. Uh I, that's, really, that's really kind of tough because, we, like you said, we've got some people who are advanced and, and some that aren't. Are, Glenn, are you, you getting stuff out of this, too? Is this making sense for you? You guys, did I did, did you lose me? Am no, I, I think Glenn, I think he's speaking, but his microphone's oh, off. Got it, got it. Okay, that's okay. There um, he goes. Oh, I'm getting it. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry, guys. I'm on now. Uh, yeah, my kids. Uh, uh, I, I think you know I'm still new to this program too. And, okay. And one of the things that was confusing early on was you went to one software to set something up, then they tell you to close that and then open another software. And I think that was that was a source of confusion the first day 
it's why are we opening cell set up and how is that related to robo cell got it so, okay so maybe if you just kind of go all the way back to that first lesson sure you mind it, if it, i you it mind would if, help. Yeah. okay you mind if i do that john sure okay show my screen all right so uh the the, the way it's explained in, in the curriculum is a powerpoint and there's all kinds of information uh, showing you how uh, the software works, uh, what to do here and there. But a couple things that I wanted to show you were uh, basically that when you save one of these files, when a student saves something um, on their desktop, in their folder, wherever they save it, whenever you use the software, um, I'll open up this folder, it saves a whole bunch of files. Um, it saves a PNT file. A 3DC file, an SVP file, and a .ws file. If at any point you delete one of these or move one of these, your file will never work again. So it's really good to start by having kids save stuff in a folder. So once you start, it ends up all in the same place. And it may be good if Chris go back to that folder you were just in. Um, one of the first things I do is I open one like that and I show the kids these files and I explain to them what they are. Um, yeah. The PNT, all the PNT is your stored points. If you actually open that in Notepad, all you're going to see is every one of the joints. Uh, it's basically an Excel spreadsheet. Um, it'll show every single one of the points that has been recorded. The SBP is the actual program code itself. The one at the top that's the 3DC. That's the one from Cell Setup. That's the 3D environment. Yep, 3D Cell. And the WS is the whole package. So the WS is a, just a generic folder that says these are the files that I want you to go open up. Open up this 3D cell, use these points with this program, and Chris is right. If any right. of those go wonky on you or any of those go bad, then the whole thing won't move anymore. Right. For instance, this the SBP file is this portion of your screen. The 3DC file is this portion of your screen. Uh, the points, um, I can go look at the points that I'm teaching, all of these different points, I'll show you that in a bit, are all of these different points. So it saves it as different files. Um, so if kids saves it on their desktop, and then they do another one, saves on before they do three or four of these, their desktop's full of icons. And they don't know which one that they need, they throw them out. So if they make a folder and save all their stuff in a folder so that it's nice and neat, um, it ends up looking like this, and it makes it real easy to do. But like Glenn was saying, the, the, the concept that I like to tell, to try to get across to students as they start, is that when you start in uh, Robo, so when you start using robots, the first thing you have to do is set up your factory. So there's a program called Cell Setup. So when you first start, when you want to make your cell, you open up the activity and it says go to Cell Setup. Well, Cell Setup is a separate uh, program. Uh, that looks like this, and you, Jim just had it open on your on a screen. It's a factory floor, and it lets you bring stuff in. It lets you make your factory, and all of the activities have you making your factory step by step, uh, where to put them, how to place them, and kids can also put um, plants. They'll they'll find all kinds of stuff uh, to put in. They can do anything they want. So the first step is to build your factory in this environment. Then you save that file. Then you come over to RoboCell and you say file, open a new project, and then import the 3D model of the factory that you just built. So for instance, here is the, the model for the factory for activity C, where they're going to stack something. So the kids go into cell setup, build the cell, Come into RoboCell, say File, New, and then File, Import, and they import that 3D model that's in that folder, which is the .3DC. Mm. Any questions so far? Nope. I wish I'd known that about four weeks ago. You no, know, <laughs> I, I find that that's, that concept is really not explained in the curriculum. So if, if you tell kids, well, in order to, to program a robot, you need a factory. So build the factory first, then program the robot. And the first thing kids try to do is they start to, they come over here, and they start to try to type. 
and they find that they, they you, you can't type. It's it's basically all of your commands are down here. So the first thing you want to tell students to do is you're a pro. Don't use L1 or L2. Um, pro gives you a whole bunch of commands. If you're in level one, um, you'll get fewer commands to choose from. By choosing pro, they have all these different things to choose, all these different commands to choose. So when they're programming, um, as they go through, they can use these shortcuts. Uh, for instance, I'm going to come down here to line 24. If I want to add open gripper, I just click on it, and it throws open gripper in there. I can't type. It, the program won't let me type that. It would actually will let you if you if you type OG. OG, it correct, will. correct. So if the kids start learning the shortcuts, plus up at the very top, um, that is a shortcut to the majority of the commands your kids will use. Yes, right so up. So he's here. got a bar right there that's open gripper, close gripper. All of those are programming commands. Go to position. Go linear to position. Yeah, and, you, and kids, can, you can hover over them, and you can figure out what they are too. But you can't really do any programming till you have your positions taught. Right, and that was and that's, that's, that's that's that was confusing at first because, like you said, they were trying to program it you know, without well, having positions. You know, I I have kids who once they get good at this, they write the program first because they know what they want to do step by step, and then they go in and program the positions. But you're right, Glenn. When you when you first start doing this, it's really a whole bunch of separate things. You build the factory. Then you find all the points, and in the activities, it's laid out in terms of uh, you open up the activity, and it says this is point 20, this is point 21, this is point 9. Um, and you teach it or record all those points. So once you have all the positions, then you can write the program, and you know what positions they go to. So because really all programming a robot is is programming points uh, here, 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 above, here, above, um, above over here and above here. And then the robot just goes through the motions of going to all those points. And that's all this, this robot program is. And you got to tell the kids that in reality, this, this doesn't exist. Uh, you got trainers and things that are teaching people how to use them, some simulators, that kind of stuff. But in the real world, now, I, I don't program quite like this where I'm sitting in right. front of a simulation and that's going to work in the real world. I'm going to go out to the robot and I'm going to move it and record a position, move it, record it. But I'm going to write the program and everything right there at the robot. Right. So I'm not going to be seeing a 3D cell. I'm going to be seeing the actual robot. Mm -hmm. And a couple basic things that as you get started with this, uh, things that will be helpful, and, and Glenn, you'll probably go, oh, yeah, that would have helped a lot too. Um, in terms of when you save your cell, when you're in cell setup and you save your cell, however you save it in cell setup is how it comes in every single time in RoboCell. So if you save it zoomed out um, like this, it'll come into RoboCell that way every single time. Mm -hmm. So you really kind of want to make sure that you have the cell setup exactly the way you want it. Um, it's kind of weird, too. You want kids to get used to this, to make it go up and down. You can use the, the, the bar on the side. Right-click and move your mouse up and down, and you can zoom in and zoom out. If you want to center on, say, you want to center right on the robot, you can use the redirect camera tool to click right there. It'll center it, and then you can zoom in on that particular point if you want. Um, when you go to run a program, once you want to, you want to test it out, you come up to the top line. And I can say run single step, run single cycle, or run continuously. So I want to run through this whole program. So I'm going to say run through a single cycle. And my robot will go through the motions of doing what it is it's supposed to do. I can, while it's running, I can take a look at it and see what it's doing and zoom in and zoom out. Chris, go ahead and turn on your paths. And if I want to turn on my paths, that, that button will tell me where all the parts are, what they're named. This will turn on what are called paths, and it's like little chiclets. And it puts little boxes, and it shows me where my, ro where my, my robot's gone and where it's been. And this is really a great way to tell um, if your students have done the, pro the project correctly. 
So by running this whole thing um, and going through the motions, I can see where they've used go linear. I can see where they've used uh, go circular. I can see all kinds of things. And it just, there's little dots that display where the robot's been. And they're called trails. And you can turn them on and off here and here. Chris, go ahead and reset your cell. So before I can do anything, we have to reset it. So we're going to reset the work cell by doing that. It sets it back to normal. I've got my first chiclet there. They're turned on. And now I can run it a single cycle. Now, Chris is right. Every single time he hits that reset button, it's going to go back to the view that you had typically set up in cell setup itself. But that can be manipulated right here. Um, if he likes that view that he has right this second, um, right. kind of where his mouth right, um, right next to where it says show robot path, there's an old camcorder and a, and a disc there, which the kids don't know what a camcorder is. But there's an <laughs> old VCR recorder thing there. If you hit that, it'll actually save that specific image that you have. So every time you hit right. reset, it'll stop flipping around because the kids will be zoomed way out when they were in cell setup and instead of having to go back into cell setup and change the image in there, you can just adjust it where you want, hit that button, and then every time you hit reset, it will come back. Yeah. The other problem is every time you close the software and reopen it, the 3D image will go away and you'll have to every single time go back to file, import 3D model, and it's kind of a pain. Yeah. If um, Chris goes up to window, <laughs> and goes to save user screen, as soon as he does that, next time he opens up this cell, that, that little 3D cell will pop back up too. And it takes many years to figure out where all these, all the little things are, all the little nuances too. So, you know, we were, I'm recording this and I'll try to save it up there. If, if you ever have any questions, also email us, you know, just shoot us a question. We'll be more than happy to answer it because there's usually a real simple solution, um, and it's just a. And, uh, do do you remember where to go or what to do? Is there a shortcut for loops and variable programming? A shortcut. Um, there is really no such thing as loop. Right. Loop is something you have to build. Uh, the way RoboCell is designed is basically the kids make these little portals. Um, you can put labels anywhere you want throughout the program and they become jump points. So you can say at the very beginning of the program, label, loop. The kids will see that in one of the activities. They'll be like, oh, hey, but I can't find the loop tool. It, yeah. It's not a tool. It's something that had to be developed. So right there where he has on line 11 loop, that doesn't exist. He could have called that cat as far as that mattered. But all the way down on line 27, he has jump to loop. He could have said jump to cat and it would jump back up to line 11. You have to manually do that. Right, and that, that uh, loop is called a label. So when I want to put something in there, I can call it anything I want. If I wanted to put a label there and then jump to it, I can click on the label and I type in, um, uh, you can call it booger, it doesn't matter what you call it, and then you can say, kids love to do that because I use that as an example in class, and you can jump to booger. It, it'll do whatever you want, and that's the one thing. Kids see this, and they're like, I can't find the loop command. Well, there is no loop command. It's a, it's a label that somebody's come up with. And these variables, there is no variable. There is no command variable at pick. Um, that's a variable that you've set using the variable command. And you've, you've typed in whatever it is. And since you've asked that question, and we happen to be here, uh, we might as well just clarify, too, that um, at pick means at the pick point, which is it's right at the part. Um, at pick plus one takes whatever number that is, whatever position that is, and adds one to it. Drop is the, the drop point where it's going to drop it off. Um, and what I've done when I, when I, uh, when I put my programs together, I, I like to lay it out and put remarks so that kids can see. And again, you, you just you find your remark, you come down here and find uh, program flow, remark is RE. So I double click and I typed in 
plus, 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 set variables, plus, 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 blah, blah, blah. And it breaks up the program. It gives it a little bit of, um, kids have a better idea they can see. All right, so I'm going to set my variables first. Then, when I go to do this loop, what it's really doing is I'm going to stack. So I set my variables. I actually do the stack. Then I change my variables by one. And if the at pick, if this value is greater than three, then stop. It goes to the end. And it goes to position 99 fast, and the program's over. What happens if it's less than three? Well, it's going to jump back to loop, come back to loop, and do this all over again. Now it's two, jump to loop, now it's three, go to end, done. And what you can do is you run this single cycle, uh, let's turn on my trails, um, and run through. And if you, you've got to set it 50%, it'll allow you to... Uh, a kid enough time to see where it is. Okay, it's going to this position, going to this position. Also, use the, the run single line if you want, and then every time they click the button, it runs the next line. So you saw it jump down here quick. It determined that it was still less than, that, I'm sorry, that it was still uh, greater than three, and it ran back up here to do it again. So once it gets the third block, this is not true anymore. I'm sorry, this is true, and it goes to end, and it's all done. So the end and loop, I'm sorry, the loop are just remark or not remarks, they're um, labels that you've told it to go to. And do you see what happened? You see how my uh, trails went away? You're, it, it's, like a, it's like a pen. With, it's like a Pez dispenser, and it throws out all these little Pezes, and once your Pez dispenser runs out, it resets. So I had too many points, and it reset. So that's what happened. You can happened. turn it off and turn it on. While, so if it's going right. back over a path that it's already done, have the kids turn it off, because they'll get to the very end, and that's how I have mine turn it into me. I have them turn it in with those paths turned on, and they'll get to the very end of it, and it'll do that, and they're like, oh, I ran out. You can, <laughs> those, that up and down motion where it's putting it on the stack, you can just turn it off. They don't go away. You can just turn it off, and it'll stop spitting them out, and then you can turn it back on again when it's making a new path. Yeah, and I can, I can turn it off and turn it on at will, so then you don't have, like you said, like Jim said, and I didn't reset the, I didn't go all the way back to the top when I reset this, so it ran into my part. Impact occurred error generally occurs when your uh, gripper is closed and you try to pick something up. Um, some other common errors. Another common error uh, point is not in the Cartesian workspace. When you get that error, it generally means that the pitch, at which it has to be negative 90. So if you were to look at all your points, um, you would need to see that it, it, right now this position is negative 90. Um, if you leave that at zero, it's at a position where this can't actually be. It will hit itself or it runs into a limit. And that won't work. Good question on the uh, the loop, on how to on how to do a loop. Yeah, concerning that uh, cart out of Cartesian coordinate system, yes. we we kept interpreting that as wait, well, hey, something's wrong with our x y location or z location. And well, it turned out to be the like you said, the gripper arm had tilted back and was out of range. Yes. And we finally figured that out. Right. That's what it means. We were adjusting location of blocks and, well, it's in the pad, it's in the, it's in the envelope, but it's something still out of range. And it's right. Out the... Good. Because in, in here's, uh, here, what I did was I went to view and I said, show me all my positions. So I make the kids give me a screenshot of this too and it tells me where all their positions are. If you take a look, um, when you start teaching positions, and if I wanted to teach a position down here, it wants me to type in all these coordinates. And if a kid inadvertently uh, forgets to type in negative 90 and just leaves that at zero, you'll get that error right off the bat. And you won't know why. You won't have any idea why. And it's because this is not negative 90 or something other than zero. They left it at zero. Any 
It, does, is this anybody have any other questions? Maybe. Jim, you have anything you want to? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say um, a couple of my students when they're opening up in cell setup, they're only having um, the two U arm. Is there a way to find the four as well, or is that a technical issue? Um, that should see. be there. Yeah. Show her when he goes it's, to it's, cell setup. You know, It'll ask him which robot he wants to do. As soon as you say file new, you should be able to choose the for you. Okay? okay. Um, when you it's say doing it, so it's probably just something on that one computer. Okay, and yeah, that, that, that's that's definitely possible too. So you can select the robot. And what I tell kids to do in cell setup. Um, always choose your robot first, and it, it makes you choose the robot first. And the reason that is is because the robot is actually everything in your cell is run from um, where that robot is. The base of that robot is zero, zero, zero. So the kids, um, I, I always tell the kids, put your robot in first. I'm going to do it without a slide base, bam. And the first thing they'll do is they'll tilt it, and they're like, wow, cool, it's floating in midair. Yes, it is. Um, but the robot, that right there is zero, 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 the base of the robot. So... Therefore, that's all important. Now, you go and you place all of your stuff in your cell. So I take the table. I can change the color of my table. Um, chartreuse is always popular. And I can change the size of my table. I can say, okay, and I can put my table in like this. I got lucky, the fact that it ended up where it's it kind of is supposed to be. Um, if you want to move something, you have to use the archaic tools up here. I have to drag the object. All right, but you bring in your table, you bring in your parts, and when you're all done, you move them where you need them to be. Uh, but you don't, I don't, I tell the kids, never rotate your robot. You rotate your robot, all your X, Y, Z coordinates are all wonky. They're all backwards, left is right, right is left. So um, leave your robot alone, Which move your table. Honestly, it's backwards anyways. Correct. What we would typically think is X is side to side, it's not. Y is side to side and X is in and out. Right. I, I've never under, quite understood that, but it is. This is your Y axis on an IntelliTech robot. This is your X axis, and up and down is still Z. So they've got the Z right anyway. Chris, you can show them how to turn on the envelope. Yeah, so if I were to hit escape, I can double click on my robot, and I can say show my envelope, and that shows my work envelope. So, oh, okay, my robot can move. I can then take my table uh, and, and move my table so that I can fit it to my work envelope. And if I, can, if I leave my envelope there, um, it'll come in with my envelope on also. And it's a real good discussion opportunity to start talking to them about why it's a Pac-Man shape instead of a full circle. Um, most of the kids will finally come up with its wiring. They know that it, you know, it can't go back there because the wires will get twisted up. And the other point that you start talking to the kids about is they'll put objects right on the blue line, and then they can't reach it. So right. you start talking to them about, okay, well, why can the robot not reach the blue line? Because well, it's based off of its gripper on how it is right now. And then we can talk about, you know, Pythagorean theorem that the hypotenuse is longer than that leg is. He, he can't. Once the, once the gripper's straight up and down, it physically cannot reach all the way out to that line. So... Not only do they have to stay inside that, but they've got to stay a little bit you know, offset from it to get in it. If they put it right on the edge, you can't reach it. Right. And a lot of times, too, it depends on, um, I always tell kids, stay way inside this work envelope. And they're like, well, that's not, that's not fair. Why, why would they tell me it's here? If I put a block there, I can't get to it. Well, you may be able to get to it, but not from where your arm is. It depends on all of the different joints. So... Stay way inside here, and you'll be safe. Uh, that comes up. Uh, that comes into play in the activity. Let's see. File. Well, Let's and you're going to be here. showing them a PowerPoint that starts talking about work envelopes. And right. they, one of the pictures shows that a jointed arm robot will have a spherical envelope uh, for what it can and can't do. Um, when you do the activity where a student has to, to write their initials, uh, go circular. You're, when you go to do that, 
um, it's actually going to draw something. So I'm going to turn on my. Uh, you can go to 3D image and get it. You're trying to turn on the envelope. Yes. You go up to your 3D image drop down. And I all can... the way at the bottom. Bingo. So I don't know why it's not as nice and neat as it is in the cell no. setup. Cell setup, you just double click it. Right. And so when you start drawing letters or, or making it move in paths, like uh, you're making the robot do markings and spray painting, you notice how I make the students make all their points way inside this because once the robot gets out here, you see how the gripper's at negative 90? It's straight up and down. It can't get all the way out here with the gripper like that. So because the gripper's like that, it can only get out to about here. If you take the gripper and point it out straight out, it might be able to get here, but it's really kind of crazy. So uh, as you're doing this, too, kids will get good at knowing when to turn off the trails so you can see just the letters. And I didn't do such a good job at that. You can see that it's supposed to say PLTW, uh, but the robot, uh, we do this activity in my classroom where the kids actually go pick up a marker and then draw letters on the table, on a piece of paper on the table. Um, I've seen people do it with uh, uh, barcodes, too. They make barcodes with a black marker that actually work. But so the work envelope, that's pretty key, too. And so I'm ready. To, if I'm done with my cell, if this is my cell setup, um, user objects, um, I'm going to put a user object in there. Oops, I put a chair on top of a table. Uh, object 2, this is the first thing kids will do, by the way, is they'll go find out what all these objects are. Uh, the plants are always popular, as are the chairs. Um, I have kids put a chair next to the table. They'll pick up blocks and drop it on the chair, and they stick to the chair. It's really kind of funny. Um, there's all kinds of different objects in here. Play around with it and see what's in there. Um, I know, Jim, I know you use some of the welding tools, etc. Yeah, I have the kids weld. Um, when it comes to doing their initials there, I take my kids down to the weld shop, and he teaches them a little MIG welding. That's awesome. And then when they come back, instead of just having the robot draw and turn on the chiclets, they go grab the MIG gun and they make the robot actually weld their name. Cool. Now, notice, if my cell's all set, this is the way I want it. I'm ready to save my cell. When I say file save, the first thing I want, oops, the, the thing that I want to make sure that I do, um, and I didn't, I'm going to grab my whole factory and push it, pull it over this way. Um, I want to make sure that I leave this exactly the way I want it when I save it and say file save. That way it'll come into the other software. And like Jim said, you can fix that. But if you save it here, you're all set. Um, that's kind of cool, too. Um, so make your cell. Make your factory. Design your factory. I'm not going to save it. And then teach your positions. And then write your program. And you're all set. That's that. Those are the steps to go through overall to um, making a a successful RoboCell foray, a, a successful do one of the activities successfully. Hey Chris, let me show my screen real quick. Sure. Um, I know a lot of you probably need writing assignments. Um, when my kids get all done with all of the RoboCell tutorials that we're supposed to do, so they do you know, A B C D F G H, they get into the handshaking. When mine are all done with that. Um, I'm trying to get them out to the mill. I'm trying to get my kids to cycle through so I can do my containers. And I really need a time-consuming project that can keep everybody busy while <laughs> I'm running my mill. So what I make the kids do is make their own story. Um, they have to go in. They've got to make their own cell. They have to bring in multiple. <coughs> um, the handshaking only has them bring in one. So they make a robot that will tend to two mills or a mill and a lathe or a mill and a welding torch um, and then they actually have to, let's see I've got a couple examples, um, they have to explain to me what their robot is and then they have to break this all up into uh, different steps. These are the things that are happening, the robot grabs, mill turns on, tell me about inputs and outputs and I get to count this as one of their writing assignments. So that's one. 
Um, here's one that's gone a little bit more in depth as far as they're supposed to have a paragraph in the beginning that really tells me about their widget. Um, what is this thing that it's making? So it's this one, it looks like it pulls up the piece and it runs it by a sensor to find out did it pick up the yellow piece or the red piece. The yellow piece goes to one mill, the red piece goes to a different mill. And then they have to have a place where they're packaging. So they actually get to have quite a bit of fun going through and building a cell to create a whatever, um, showing me their digital inputs, outputs. This is not part of the curriculum. I use this as my time consumer. And then they've got to show me, so when I start reading their code, where all their positions are. And some of them really get into and really do some pretty cool stuff. And um, looks like this one, this student has positions recorded but doesn't have any of the storyline yet. So they'll have to go back because that's, that's a big part of what I'm looking for. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice disclaimer. I'll have to let him know that tomorrow. So, you know, while I'm while I'm taking kids out to the mill, that's that's what mine are working on. And honestly, they have a lot of fun, and they go through and they're doing it all on their own. And once they get it done, they can start adding stuff. And I don't know, they can just make it pretty cool. And you have in cell setup, you have sample programs. If I open up a project. You have all these programs that they can kind of look at, and there's a sample one that they can look at. This is built into your software. The really cool part is it has an error in it. Um, about a quarter of the way through the program, it crashes. So you have to readjust a point real quick, and, but then you can run it. So it's kind of funny that their demo that they send out to everybody doesn't actually run. But if you want to know more about like the welding ones, you have all the welding ones. So if you want to do a butt joint or a T-joint or those kinds of things, um, they're all there. If I come to T-joint, there's a little video that you know, shows the torch. And you actually get to come down here and you get to set up the machine. Voltage tap, wire diameter, all that. I mean, it's, it's a very cool thing. When it's done welding, you can double click on the weld and it will tell you if it was a good weld or not. And if you get kids that are way ahead, shove them over on this and make them figure it out. But yeah, there's some very cool things that this software will do that you can use as buffers, some time eaters for some of the rest of the stuff. So we're at 6 o'clock. Um, if you have any questions, Chris and I will stay on. But please, please, please take the opportunity. If you're any questions at all, email Chris and I. We've, you know, we've been reserving time to, to try to help you out as much as we can and, and try to make things so that they're not frustrating for you.